like um, say the Brower Nap of Cotton Barrel, um, uh, Jimmy Huntington and Sidney Huntington. Sidney is about 90 now. He wrote uh, Shadows on the Koyaka. Excellent books. Uh, but they never talked about some of the painful things that we've experienced in, in our world. And, and they never whine about the things that uh, have taken place. Uh, and, and we have been through a tremendous amount of change in a compressed period of time. Our culture is being 10,000 years old, and the modern world is less than 200 for us. <clears throat> but uh, in that period of time, uh, the Aleuts almost got totally decimated by the Russians uh, through disease and enslavement. And uh, we had been struck by many diseases uh, that we had no immunity to, diphtheria, influenza. Uh, in my day, tuberculosis hit everyone. Virtually every family was uh, touched by tuberculosis, lost people. We've had uh, diphtheria, chickenpox, measles. And uh, uh, we had uh, uh, our livelihood changed uh, when the whalers came and took, began to take most of the whales. It made life very difficult for people. They began to take the walrus for the ivory when whales were not uh, as numerous or uh, in the value of the uh, baleen began to fall. And then we were hit with the gold rush. And the reality is we, we, we were not citizens. Uh, between 1867, when Alaska was purchased by Russia, by the United States, we essentially had no legal status. Uh, we were not citizens of America until 1924. So between 1867 and 1924, we had no way to protect ourselves from the encroaching canneries that were, that were being placed uh, virtually on every stream of any consequence starting in southeast Alaska all the way to the Arctic Circle in my hometown. They began to take the land. And oddly enough, it was the Oregon law that was adopted in 1884 uh, that provided the, uh, the legal way for the miners to get their claims. Uh, and we had, of course, no way to protect ourselves. So uh, the, the, the reality is that our world had changed dramatically uh, in a relatively short period of time. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, our language and cultural practices had been repressed uh, by uh, the government um, and so we are struggling now to maintain our languages and to revive our, our cultures uh, in, in modern times. Um, and on top of that of course uh, statehood came and in the fine print which most of us were unaware of um, essentially the federal government was giving the new state the chance to select over 100 million acres of land uh, under the terms of the Statehood Act without recognizing any rights that Native people had to any of Alaska. And uh, so I did a little research paper in 1966 when I was at the university called What Rights to Land Have the Alaska Natives? And so to me it was a great revelation because our own people, of course, are intimately tied to the land. For thousands of years we've lived there and, but we did not know the history. We did not know international law. We did not know constitutional law. We did not know the politics. And uh, all of a sudden, at the 11th hour, uh, we had to make a desperate fight to uh, save some of our land. And that's what, uh, oddly enough, thanks for Richard Nixon <laughs> from Whittier, California. He signed the legislation. And he backed it. Let's give old Dick a clap. <laughs> he doesn't get a clap very much, but in this case it's okay. Because he got behind the legislation, and even Spiro Agnew was helpful, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, so, so we have 44 million acres, and we have a billion dollars that uh, Congress passed and, and uh, um, capitalized uh, the corporate entities that are controlled, owned and controlled by Native people. So we do have a say in the economy. Thank you. And uh, so you'll find that story in my book. It's not the book about the land claims. 
But I think that you'll find that when you look through the story of my life, it is the story literally of tens of thousands of Alaska Natives who've had to struggle to try to understand the new world that uh, was, was coming upon them. And uh, in the end, it's a hopeful book because it really is a story about spirit. Um, it is a story about change. Uh, it is a story about values, that is, our values that sustained us for literally thousands of years, which in many cases are actually more rigid than the Ten Commandments. So we didn't have to have cops uh, on every corner to tell us what was right and wrong. <laughs> and uh, so I just wanted to say uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I spent time at the museum uh, today. Uh, it's a wonderful depiction of uh, our uh, traditional life and some of the more modern implements that uh, uh, we have also made. Uh, it took a, a lot of in ingenious effort uh, to survive in that kind of environment. We had to understand it. We under understand the animal life. And uh, I never met Dr. Jensen. I knew of him because I read the Thunder Times diligently in those days, and he was uh, often uh, written up in there. And uh, I knew Earl Parishow, who, uh, who gave uh, uh, some of his uh, parkas and whatnot uh, to the museum. Uh, I knew Art Umituk, uh, you know, who has been down here uh, working with your collections. And so I'm very pleased that uh, you're here to support, support the museum. Uh, because, uh, you know, the Arctic is very important and becoming more important and it's getting warmer. So we may be growing grapes up there too someday. <laughs> and so I won't keep you long, as I said. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the invitation and the hospitality that uh, you people have shown me. Thank you. See you next.